morning to those of us throughout the rest of the country. Um, it's Friday. It's before a holiday weekend. I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, go ahead and uh, learn a little bit this morning about uh, Lepitect and protocols around Lepitect. It's a really interesting product. I think you guys are really going to enjoy learning a little bit about it. Um, real quick, uh, before we get started, uh, we'll take questions at the end. If you have any questions at all throughout this webinar, You'll notice over there on the right-hand uh, side of your screen, you have the Go To Meeting dialog box. If you click that arrow at the top of the box, there's a section there that says Questions. Um, if there is a plus uh, sign next to that question box right now, click on that. That will expand it, and you can type your questions in there. And we'll try to adjust um, all of our questions here at the end of the uh, um, reviewing session here today. We're also recording this webinar, so if you'd like to go and review this or if you would like to pass this on to friends, it can be found on our website. So real quick, the person talking to you through your computer today, my name is Patrick Anderson. I'm an arborologist with Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements. My job is to work with our remote staff throughout the country as well as our clients to help them with product support, protocol support, diagnosis, things of that nature. Um, at any time, please feel free. You can. My information is there. You can always email me after this session or during the session if you really want to. Um, you can always feel free to call me there. That's my direct line. I accept text messages through that line as well. And then you also see our tech support number, that 1877 number. You can call that number at any time to get somebody live on the phone, an actual human being picks up the phone, um, and you'll be able to get, again, uh, information about ordering products, pricing, uh, information on protocol, support for rates, anything like that. Uh, you can call that tech support number at any time. And just a real quick, who is Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements? Well, we provide products and protocols for the arboriculture industry as well as other landscape management um, groups. And we were born out of a full care tree service company that is located in uh, Minnesota in the Twin Cities area of Minneapolis and St. Paul. So when we bring equipment or products or protocols to the industry to, to sell to all the arborists out there throughout the country that has gone through rigorous tests through our tree care side so that we know that when we bring you again a piece of equipment or a protocol that we can give you really predictable results and again equipment that you'll be really, really happy with. Uh, we have been around for really over 35 years, but we have many years, many decades of practical plant health care experience. We have a trove of ISA certified arborists and board certified master arborists. So again, if you were to call that 1877 number for tech support and that person on the other line cannot get you an answer right away, we have a, a decades, if not hundreds of years worth of plant health care knowledge um, on hand so that we can get back to you at the least by the end of the day with difficult questions. Um, our commitments to you, um, our clients, is to advance the science of tree health care and to serve our clients through education like things uh, like webinars like today, whether it be out in the field, training, once again, we'd be more than happy to come out and work with you in the field, work with you, work with your technicians, um, and finally, of course, developing and improving tree health care protocols. Um, we have a full research and development department that works solely on plant health care protocols for arboriculture and again other landscape management um, industries. So every part of a profit that we make by, by selling a product to you, part of that profit goes right back into research and development to make our industry um, just that much better. So keep that in mind. You know, whatever product it is you're interested in purchasing, keep Rainbow in mind, knowing that we are here to try to train arborists throughout the country and, again, just improve our profession as a whole. But today, today we're going to talk about Lepitect. And so we're going to learn, you know, what is Lepitect? We're going to talk about some of the advantages of Lepitect. We're going to go over some proven research with Lepitect, and finally we're going to we're going to look at uh, Lepitect in some practical situations, maybe how you can incorporate Lepitect into some common pest protocols that you're dealing with already out there in the landscape today. So first, what is Lepitect? Well, Lepitect is acephate. It's 97% acephate. And we might be familiar with spraying acephate um, for things like orthene, and there's some other acephate spray products out there. But Lepitect is the only acephate that has a label to be soil-injected. 
this is very, very unique with Lepitect. Um, it is the only acephate, again, that has a label to be soil injected. And acephate is very, very water soluble and it moves into the plant very, very quickly and is very effective on a whole host range of pests, which of course we will uh, we'll talk about more here as we as we move in. But some other key features, some really the, the really interesting thing about Lepitec is the, is the fact that it is a soil applied product that will work on both caterpillars and spider mites. In the landscape, products labeled for the landscape, we don't have any products really that we can soil apply around a tree or a shrub that will give us good control, if any control, of caterpillars and spider mites. So this is really a really neat niche that Lepitec fills. Um, of course, it's also effective on a whole host of other insects. Again, if we're familiar with spraying orthene or acephate, uh, one of the other acephate products as a foliar spray, we know it controls a lot of pests. So again, because it moves in through the tree in a systemic fashion, all the same pests for the most part that you can spray with acephate, if you inject Lepitec into the soil around the tree, again, when the, the, the pest begins to consume leaf matter or tree matter, they'll ingest the acephate and perish. Um, again, this, this Lepitec is very, very water soluble. It moves very, very fast within a tree. We see on smaller trees, we get results, we get product into the plant within one to three days. For medium-sized trees, we're looking at seven to ten days. And for larger trees, now we're talking about trees that are upwards of around 50 inches in diameter, we're seeing uh, results within two to three weeks. So the product moves very quickly into the parts of the plant, the pests are feeding, and works very fast uh, on, again, the, the, the pest consumes parts of the plant and then begins to perish because it's exposed to that, that product. We also have a, another formulation called Lepitec Infusible that you can actually directly inject into the tree. So it has the same key pests on the label and will control the same key pests as Lepitec that you would soil inject, but this is an option for stem injection if, again, your site tree pest warrant um, that type of, a, of application um, with Lepitec. Um, now, as a stem application, and this holds true for most products that we direct inject into a stem, it's going to move a lot faster. So within one to seven days, you're going to get activity within the canopy. Um, and again, that is going to hold true um, for even some of our larger trees. Uh, again, maybe our 50-inch trees, we might be looking closer to 10 to 14 days, but again, we're going to get it into the tree very fast. Um, one of the advantages of LapTech also is, um, and again, this is maybe uh, two sides of a coin here, but Lepitec has a very, uh, it has a 30-day residual. So it moves into the plant fast and moves out of the plant fast. So we really have, when it comes to the potential for off-target pests to consume Lepitec, if we can time our applications very, very quickly, um, we can get effective control of our pests while doing little damage to maybe some of our other herbivorous insects that we're not too keen on controlling. Um, so now let's kind of move into some of our research here and, and really show how this product works and how it works very, very well on some common insects that we deal with quite regularly. So in this case here, we have a trial. This was done in 2007 on bagworms. And of course, bagworm is a huge issue throughout our entire country. Um, there's a lot of damage to a lot of different plants. So we can see here, uh, I mean, a picture tells a thousand words, but we have our control treatment versus our treated treatment, and we can see that we have significant less damage on our treated versus our control. And again, this is on honey locust, and this is planted in a median here. If we look at the, the graphs here, we can see that we have um, our application is made, and in June, July 25th, so this was, the application was made June 11th. On July 25th, this blue line represents control trees, and this is the percent defoliation. So on July 25th, we have 40% of our control trees have, have been, um, or excuse me, uh, defoliation to 40% on the crowns of our control trees is what we're observing, where we're having less than 5% with our treated trees. Likewise, now in September, we have close to 75% defoliation on our trees that were untreated, while our treated trees are still hovering around 5%. Now, it's not that the Lepitec stayed in the plant until September. Again, it, we're only looking at about a 30-day residual activity within the plant. 
But the fact is, is the divers only have one generation a year, and it works so well in that 30 days to uh, kill those bagworms that we're not seeing any other defoliation on those trees that were treated. Um, it basically wiped out that population, and now we have trees that are less than 5% defoliated versus our control trees that are approaching 75% defoliation. If we look at another common pest, especially up in the northeast, we have here gypsy moth. Uh, we know that gypsy moth can be very, very devastating to our plants. So here, in this case, what we're looking at here is gypsy moth on paper birch. Um, many people may not think of it, but paper birch is a very favorite food source of, of a gypsy moth. So again, we have our blue bars are control, our red bars are treated, and what we're looking at is percent of surviving the gypsy moth caterpillar. So again, day one after treatment, we have um, we have about 80% of our, our gypsy moth um, are surviving. Here after treatment though, and keep in mind these are relatively small trees, after treatment we are already, one day after treatment, we are already killing gypsy moth. And this is again, this is gypsy moth um, that is being uh, introduced to these plants. So here we go, 13 days after treatment, we have close to again, 70% uh, of the gypsy moth that we introduced to these plants surviving. And again, 13 days, none. 29 days, none. Now, 61 days after application, we have more we have more gypsy moth that are surviving. And again, this is gypsy moths being introduced to these plants. And again, this shows that we have a solid 30 days of control when applying Lepitec. So in this case, um, you know, if we needed to, we can apply Levitec every 30 days. So if we had a sustained outbreak after this, after these 30 days, we could reapply Levitec to get another 30 days of control. But again, look at this one day after control, one day after treatment, uh, when exposed, we have no surviving gypsy moth. Just again, Levitec works very, very well on these pests. Um, let's look at pine sawfly now. This was in a Scots pine. Uh, I just saw a, a blog post uh, saying how uh, pines out west are really getting hammered this year by pine sawfly. So here, if we take a look at an, another graph to explain how well Leptec works on some of our common pests, this graph depicts pine sawfly survivability. So again, this was an application made in May. So here we have, one day after application, we have a lot of our uh, pine sawfly surviving, close to 100% versus our control. Now, if we compare that to just 12 days later, so this is one day after application, this is 12 days application, once again, we have less, we're having around 5%, less than 10% of pine sawflies surviving when exposed to a tree that was treated with Lepitec versus up here we're over um, 60 foot, uh, preaching 65, maybe 70 percent. 26 days application, once again, we're having around 10 percent survivability on pine sawfly, whereas now our controls are hovering around 80 percent, maybe 85 percent. So again, the product moves very, very fast in the tree and is very, very effective on some of these really common pests. Japanese beetle on little leaf linden. Now this, is, of course, can be a huge issue anywhere lindens are planted, really. Here we have the percent of defoliation of lindens by Japanese beetle. We have our application date is June 12th. We're reporting data on August 17th. Once again, control is the blue. One soil treatment with Lepitec is over here. We have less than 10% defoliation on our treated trees versus over 50%, maybe pushing close to 55% defoliation on our untreated trees. Now, lindens. Um, made it in the news, um, it was the last year because of a, a very large bee kill that was unfortunate and it was a mistake on, the, in the, on the, the part of the applicator. But we now are very, very aware of the neonicotinoids when it comes to pollinators. Now, when used responsibly, the neonicotinoids like imidacloprid and dinotefrin are very, very good at, at doing what they do. And again, when used responsibly, um, should have very minimal impact on beneficial and benign insects. However, that being said, we know that there are some clients out there today, and even some of those, you know, some of us professionals 
that are, are looking to steer clear of neonicotinoids for whatever reason, and we have some clients that are very, very sensitive. So with Levitec, Levitec is not a neonicotinoid. So we have a, a soil applied product that works on a host of species that is, um, or pests rather, that is a non-neonicotinoid. So it can be applied into the soil, uh, it can be applied to the trunk of the tree, we can control many pests, and again, we can, we can tell our clients that we're not using a neonicotinoid. Again, because it moves so quickly into the plant and so quickly out of the plant, we can really, we can time it around flowering of some of our trees that we're worried about um, any product moving into the nectar of the tree as well. So again, it, it, that is one of the, the, the upsides of the fact that it moves so fast out of the plant is that we can time it around flowering, really limit the, the exposure to the product possibly getting into the, the nectar. There's, no, there's been no studies on that, so we just don't know. But we can really limit the, the ability or the chances of that moving into nectar because of the fact that it's out of the tree so fast and moves into the tree so fast. And as we see from some of these charts, it's very, very effective on these pests. So we don't need long residuals. Um, we just need to get it into the plant when that pest is active. Here's a pest that can be um, difficult to control, this, gall, this gouty oat gall, which is caused by a small stinging wasp um, here. And so this is the presence of wasp galls on swipe, swamp white oaks. Uh, the application is made here in the beginning of June, and data is reported at the end of September. And we can see that we have an average of two galls per oak, uh, on our untreated controls, and we have the presence of less, about a half a gall, um, however that works out, uh, half a gall per oak tree in our treated. So a difficult pest to control, you know, maybe one that's not too much of an issue, but certainly, you know, in high populations can be a problem. Um, certainly have some clients simply don't like them for aesthetics. Um, but Either way, a difficult pest to control, and here we have uh, some efficacy using one application of Lepitect um, per, or applied um, at the appropriate time. And the spider mite day. The spider mites, again, there's, there is no real good soil applied systemic for spider mites. Um, and this can cause problems, again, if we have issues with, we don't want to worry about drift on large trees, coverage for large trees, if we're by a body of water, um, you know, spraying a large plant or even a medium-sized plant can be a real issue, especially when we have something like spider mites. So these, what these graphs are showing is they're showing commonly applied products for spider mites, Lucid plus 1% oil, Lucid, the active ingredient is abamectin, so plus 1% oil and forbid. If you're familiar with some miticide permit, is a very good miticide. Now, again, we look at one soil application of, of Lepitect. So we have our untreated controls, and we have close to about 12 or so, between 10 and 15 mites per sample. Here, if we're looking at our, our Lepitect, one soil application of Lepitect, 27 days after application, we have less than 5 mites per sample. With lucid plus horse oil, we don't appear to have any mites, and then for bit again, we're right around Lepitec. So 27 days after application, with one application, one soil application of Lepitec, we are in the ballpark with commonly used products that work very well for spider mites. Now if we look at 43 days after application, here once again, we have a lot of mites on our untreated, and with our Lepitec, one soil application of Lepitec, we're right there less than five mites, I mean barely maybe even three mites per sample um, compared to our common products. And once again, it's not because that Lepitec is probably still active after 43 days, it's just that it does such a good job in the time that it's in the tree of uh, controlling the pests. We have, you know, a, a, the illusion almost of a long residual, but it just works very well uh, to take care of these pests. So if we look at application methods, again, we have, we are, this is the only uh, acephate, active ingredient acephate that is labeled for soil injection, specifically labeled for soil injection. And you can do that in many different ways. In, in the picture we have here, we have an example of a soil injection uh, using our HTI 2000, which um, is a really neat tool that accurately measures 250 milliliters of product per, um, per injection. So there's a cylinder in there, 
you push a button that fills a cylinder from your uh, your water source or your 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 solution source. Uh, again, this could be from the hydraulic sprayer of your truck or a powered backpack. And then once you have that cylinder filled, that fills the 250 milliliters. You push another button that injects that 250 milliliters, and then it keeps track of how many times you've injected a treat. But again, we can do very low volumes of this product. We can inject anywhere from eight ounces of solution per inch of diameter to a gallon of solution per inch of diameter. So again, depending upon what, what means you're soil injecting, you have a lot of different ways, a lot of different solution uh, rates to put it in. Now, the reason why we want to keep it close to the tree, research has shown that um, we are best served by injecting as close to the tree as possible. And one of the reasons for that is, is, a, is a probably a pretty common sense one is, we inject close to the tree, that product simply has less um, area to cover until it gets into the plant and starts becoming active. So by getting it closer to the tree, our solution closer to the tree, the product has less space it needs to move into, and it simply gets up into the tree faster. The other reason is, if you look at this picture here, um, you can see when we do a root collar excavation very close to the base of the tree, we have a lot of feeding roots. We have a lot of those fine roots that are taking up water and minerals and, and insecticides or products that we put into the soil. So when you inject close to the soil, you simply have more roots per um, any cubic volume of soil. So you're applying that product directly to a lot, root, a lot of roots, whereas if you get further away from the tree, certainly we have a lot of feeder roots out there, but they're, uh, they're, they're, they're not covering as much area in any, any given volume of soil. So if we apply close to the tree, where it's just less um, area that the product has to cover to get into the tree, and we're just getting it to more roots that can put it then into the tree. Our mix rates for this are 10 ounces um, per 25 to 50 inches of diameter. So your 25 inches would be at the, the higher rate for larger trees or more difficult to control pests, and your 50 inches diameter would be for smaller trees or easier to control pests. And again, the product comes in a 10 ounce, a pre-measured 10 ounce foil pack that you can uh, simply just tear open and pour into your solution. It also comes with a spoon so you can measure either one or two inch increments of the product into solution. Again, we have a, a trunk injection um, formulation of Leptec as well called Leptec Infusible. Uh, this here does not have a linear relationship with the diameter, so we have a, um, you can see here, our diameter and the number of packets. This comes in pre-measured, again, full packets that you would cut open and pour into solution. So the diameter, uh, the number of packets, and then the milliliters of water so that we get at, so we get enough distribution within the canopy. And you can see we can do this with the mills of water, you know, 30 inches we're only injecting 400 mils of water or solution. So we can do this with a micro injection system. Uh, in this case, it's pictured using our Q Connect system, which works very, very well. Um, it's, a, it's a harness type system so that we can inject into several portions of the root flare all at once. It is pressurized using a simple bike pump, and we're not requiring the use of any kind of plug with this system. We simply drill a 15 64 inch hole, install our T, pressurize our system, and the product goes in very quickly, very effectively. So now let's take a look at incorporating Lepitect into some common protocols. So one pest that we're probably all dealing with, it's probably the most common pest, and in some cases some of the most damaging pests out there within our landscape, um, aphids of course. So if we look real quick at an aphid life cycle, they overwinter as eggs on the host in the bark or under the buds or in a protected place. In the spring, when the temperature is warm, they hatch from their eggs, they migrate out into their host, they have several generations a year, um, they, can, they have uh, asexual reproduction throughout the, throughout the year, they can give birth to live young throughout the year, and then in fall, as the temperatures start to um, fall, they then they lay their eggs again in a, in a protected spot and they begin to overwinter again. If we look at physically how to identify an aphid, we have both a, a, a wingless form and a winged form, and this winged form is responsible for really starting new colonies on new host plants. 
So you can find both the winged and non-winged aphids on the planet at any given time. And one of the ways to really tell the difference if you have an aphid or something else is they have these two protrusions coming out of their back end. So if you see these two things coming off a, an insect that is very small, then you know you have an aphid piercing, sucking, damaging insect. And of course, we're probably very aware of what the damage looks like. They, of course, they passively feed within the, the tree. So anything that they cannot digest, they immediately poop out their back end. There's a sugary substance called honeydew. The honeydew, again, is very full of sugar and starch. Uh, a fungus called sooty mold likes to grow on that, so you get this, this sooty mold covered leaf, you get this yellowing, you get some leaf distortion. Uh, of course, this sooty mold can get all over patio furniture, cars, what have you. Um, so again, we have many different ways to treat for aphids, and again, many of us have probably been treating for aphids for a long time. Uh, hoard oils work very well if you can get it right to the tree. Uh, a lot of these different spray products work very well if you can get them to the pest itself. <clears throat> and again, from soil treatments, we have our neonicotinoids like imidacloprid and donatefrin that work very, very well. Um, but we also have Lepitec. Um, in this case here, we have Lepitec, which moves very, very fast in the tree, much faster than imidacloprid will. It will be very, very effective on aphids. And again, this is an alternative to a neonicotinoid, which either the, both the imidacloprid and the dinotectoran are neonicotinoids. Again, if we are in an area where we have clients that are sensitive to this issue, uh, if you yourself are sensitive to this issue, we have now an option that works very well, moves very fast in the tree, um, has a 30-day residual. So once again, we can time it around flowering of some of our flowering, you know, our, our flowering plants that are um, visited by pollinators and other things. Um, a good, good option now other than the neonicotinoids. Likewise, with tree injection, we can always do a tree injection, something like a metacloprid, but now we also have this, Lepitec, which we can directly inject into the tree, move into the tree that much faster, be very, very um, effective against our pests. And once again, if we have issues with clients that are sensitive to the neonicotinoids, which we, I will restate again, when used correctly and responsible, the neonicotinoids are a great way to control a lot of our plant damaging pests, but again, if we have people that are sensitive to that, um, we have the, the option now to use Lepitec, which will work very well for us. Let's move into spider mites. So spider mites, again, a very damaging pest in the landscape, very often found in the landscape. Um, you know, the diagnosis of, la of the spider mites is we have the stippling of the leaf. Um, again, we often find our, especially our warm season mites, uh, up against the foundation of the house, we can start seeing this, this yelling, this grain, this general decline of part of the plant, and that's all due to the spider mite damage. Um, in some cases, some species, and when they're in high enough population, we'll get some actual some webbing that we can see on the plant. Uh, we know we have a huge population in, in a case of that. And then finally, if you really want to know whether or not you have active spider mites, and we'll talk about that there in a second, but to, to tell whether or not you have active spider mites, you always have the option of doing the, the white paper test where you simply take a piece of the plant that you suspect might be affected by the spider mites, slap it on a white piece of paper. You can either use a hand lens to see if you can find them crawling around or simply just wipe your hand across that and see if you're getting any little red smudges or streaks, and that's the telltale sign that you have some spider mites. Now, spider mites can be lumped into two different categories. We have cool season mites, which are aptly named because they are most active in the cool season. So these guys are going to overwinter as eggs on the bark or the needles, again, in a, a, a protected spot. Now, when it warms up, now, when we talk about warming up, we're talking about 55 degrees. When it gets to be about 55 degrees, maybe, you know, give or take, maybe, you know, 45, maybe 60, these guys are going to start hatching and they're going to start feeding, and they're going to enjoy themselves feeding on plants until it really starts getting warmed up. Again, you know, once we get to temperatures, average daytime temperatures around 85 degrees, then the population is going to fall. They're going to, what they're going to do is basically they're going to go hide, and they're going to hang out until the fall, when, again, that population comes back down, and then they're going to reemerge and start doing damage. And in parts of the country where we have mild winters, again, places like, Florida, along the Gulf Coast, Texas, we might have cool season mite activity throughout the entire winter. Um, so, 
Again, this is where knowing whether or not we have active mics comes into play because if we try one of these Fuller applications or even a Levitech application, when the mics aren't active, then we're simply we're not going to get effective control. Another thing of note is a lot of times damage from cool season mites won't show up until it gets really hot and dry. So if we are treating the symptoms and not the signs, then we're not going to get control because those mites aren't active. Now again, for warm season mites, once again, very aptly named, these guys actually overwinter as females. And then once the temperature starts to increase, again, about 60 to 65, they become active. They begin laying eggs, and again, multiple generations throughout the year. And then in the fall, as the temperatures start to decrease, those guys will go, the females will go, they'll overwinter and wait again for it to get warm again. There are a lot of different fuller products that we can use for spider mites. And part of this is probably driven by the nursery industry because the spider mites can be a huge issue within nurseries. And, you know, if we're familiar with the, uh, um, especially the spider mites' ability to become resistant to certain chemistries after they're sprayed over and over and over again, um, this is why we have a lot of different miticides that come out of the nursery industry and then find their way into the landscape. And again, you know, from a fuller application, we have a lot of different products that work very well on spider mites. But it's important to know what they work on. So, for instance, floor mite, it only treats adults and eggs. Uh, for big, it works very well. It treats uh, adults, eggs, and nymphs. And, of course, uh, we have hexagon, which treats nymphs and eggs. But an interesting thing about hexagon is that the females actually lay non-viable eggs. So that's kind of interesting. But once again, we don't have any, again, in the landscape, we don't have any options for a, a soil-applied miticide that works well. And in Lepitec, once again, we do. So again, we can soil inject it for spider mites. Uh, we want to we time it around when they first become active at their first emergence. And again, if we need to, in the case of something like a warm season mite, we can follow up every 30 days, um, if need be, to continue to, to control these mites. And again, if we look at just one more quick study, a simple uh, untreated versus one treatment of Lepitec, here we have honey locust spider mite. Uh, we have it 60 days after application. If we look here, we have, again, if we're looking at the number of mites per sample, we have over 140 mites. 60 days later, after one application of Levitec, you know, we're, we're not even up to 20, we're not even up to 10 mites per tree. So again, it was very fast, works very well on spider mites, um, and will give us a lot of really good control. We'll conclude here with caterpillars. Um, there are a lot of different caterpillar pests out there. You know, we discussed bagworms a little bit. It's a common pest um, all over the country. They start to become active around the time yellowwoods bloom uh, here out east. Uh, we have orange-striped oakworm, which is a huge issue in the southeast. These guys become active mid-summer. We have tent caterpillars, which can be found a lot of parts uh, around the country. They like to feed on um, uh, trees and plants in the prunus family. They usually start hatching when we start seeing the first Persithia flowers. And then we have things like canker worms and leaf rollers, which again can be found all over our country. Uh, and they usually become active around the time of oak bud break. So a lot of different caterpillar pests, different degrees of importance, whether they be simply an aesthetic issue, a nuisance issue, or really can defoliate a plant. Um, and you know we have some options. For years, we've been spraying for them. Uh, we have things like Conserve, which is spinosis, which works really well and is soft on beneficials. We have our bifenthrins and fermenthrins that work very well, have a, a long residual, uh, but also will affect a lot of, of our arthropods, both um, benign and beneficial. And then, of course, we have a foliar applied acetate, which lasts about two weeks within the landscape, works very well, but of course, with Lepitec, we have a soil application. So again, with that soil application, we're not going to be affecting, if the, if the pest is not, or mind you, if the arthropod is not feeding on the tree, we're not going to affect it. Um, so, you know, again, we have a soil applied option that works very well in caterpillars, if we remember some of those uh, charts we looked at. And again, we have that same application as a stem injection, if again, the site, the tree, the pest, what have you, uh, lend itself better to stem injection. And again, that stem injection is going to move um, that much faster within the plant. So again, one soil application of Lepitec will take care of, a, a care of a lot of our caterpillar pests um, and do it very, very effectively. 
And here is real quick, this was a picture that I took earlier this year. This is on canker worm. See, this is a single stem injection of Lepitect at the first sign of canker worms. And here we have her untreated. This was taken um, approximately 30 days after treatment. So again, one uh, treatment of Lepitect infusible. We have a full, beautiful canopy here we have a canopy that's close to 50% defoliated. It's a stark contrast there um, when, you, when you look at that type of thing. So again, to wrap up, you know, Lepitect is effective on a range of tree damaging pests, um, most notably uh, spider mites and caterpillars. Again, it's the only soil applied product that will get predictable results in the landscape on spider mites and caterpillars. It moves very quickly into the tree, controlling a lot of different plants and it has again has that 30 day residual. So if you time it around the flowering of trees and shrubs that we're worried about um, pollinators visiting, we can be pretty safe in not getting that product into the nectar and not exposing those again those beneficial and benign insects to our solution. Uh, we do have some more upcoming product webinars next week. We have a Canvastat webinar that is coming up next Wednesday, the same time as our, our discussion today. We have an Alamo um, webinar coming up again next Thursday, same time as today. Um, I really uh, would encourage you to, to check those out if you have the time. And then finally, if you haven't heard, we have a campaign going on uh, saluting branches. This is an effort to do a day of uh, volunteer work at 22 cemeteries, this is 22 veteran cemeteries throughout the United States. We're going to do a day of volunteer work on September 23rd of this year. So we are going to prune these trees, we're going to take out any um, potentially hazardous deadwood, we're going to do any kind of tree removal that needs to be done, we're going to do everything we can in one day uh, at 22 cemeteries throughout the country. If you'd like to know more, you can please visit salutingbranches.org. Uh, right now, of course, we're in need of volunteers. We need skilled people out there that can go out there and actually do the work, climb the trees, run the chainsaws, run the chippers. We need equipment. And we'll also accept cash donations so that we can purchase T-shirts for everybody uh, that come out and visit that day, as well as lunches and, and little things like that. So again, saluting branches, uh, a day of service at our veteran cemeteries. Um, please check out that website. And then finally now we'll conclude with some questions. Once again, my name is Patrick Anderson. You can email me here at panderson@treecarescience.com. You can call or text me at, at there at my number there. And again, if you have any further protocol support questions, product questions, pricing, things like that, uh, you can call that tech support line at any time and um, they'll be able to help you out. And with that, we have some questions. So let me pop out my uh, my question box here and let's see. Um, so here there is a slide you're not consistent in showing how Lepitec is being applied. I'll take a look at that. Thanks for that. Um, as far as uh, rates are concerned possibly is what you're referring to there. But we'll, we'll take a look at that for you. And then the question here is does this product control wood boring insects? Um, the product, yes it does. It will control both um, flathead or excuse me, but yeah, no, it'll control, Levitech um, applied to the soil injection will control um, flathead borers and the infusible has some label language around controlling some of the long uh, horn borers, but that is, uh, that language has to do with um, the USDA and their eradication programs. Um, now that being said, you know, there's other products out there that um, are going to work maybe a little bit better, have a little bit better residual for you with the flat-headed borers. So it's labeled for flat-headed borer. Uh, we don't have much research on how well it would work on a flat-headed borer. So um, you know, you're certainly welcome to, to give it a shot. Um, but again, we don't have very much research on that. And especially you know, with things like emerald ash borer, um, you know, we're recommending some of the other products just because you have a longer um, residual in the tree, if that makes sense. And then, is it restricted in any state? Um, 
it's not registered in every single state, so you're going to have to refer to um, the label as to what states that's in, and we can um, we can get back to you on that one, uh, whether it's uh, restricted in your state or labeled in your state. Um, again, California and New York, they have their own special law sometimes. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how they're, they're looking at Lapitec. But we'll get back to you on that. Okay, guys. Well, with that, if there are no more questions, then um, we'll conclude our session today once again. Please feel free to uh, contact me directly or call the tech support line again for pricing, uh, protocol support, and uh, questions on any other other products. Um, keep in mind that uh, we have two more webinars coming up next week. You can visit our website, treecarescience.com, to learn more about that. And with that, again, you guys have a good weekend, a good holiday, and we'll talk to you all later. Bye.